Welcome to Lecture for Abnormal Psychology. We'll be talking today about uh, psychotic disorders, also referred to as uh, schizophrenic spectrum disorders. Overview, we'll talk about uh, some of the symptoms involved in these disorders. Generally, can be categorized as positive, negative, or disorganized. We'll talk about the DSM criteria for schizophrenia itself, and then a little bit about the other uh, schizophrenic spectrum disorders, uh, and then overall uh, etiology, kind of causes, and treatment. Okay, positive symptoms. Well, why are they called positive symptoms? Well, they're kind of positive. They're extra. They're distortions of normal functions. So things that most people do or experience, but more. So hallucinations. You think, well, most people hallucinate? Well, not exactly, but people do have um, perception. They, they hear things. They see things. But typically, they're there. This is where there's a distortion of that normal function, where there's something more uh, going on. Uh, in particular, they're typically having uh, perception without sensation, right? So hearing things where there is no physical noise to be heard, seeing things where there is no light striking your retina, causing you to, to see something. In the, the psychotic disorders, uh, the hallucinations can take on various forms, uh, auditory, visual, tactile, you feel like you know, bugs are crawling on your skin, uh, but primarily they're auditory in nature. Um, which is um, kind of one thing that's a little bit interesting. Um, if you look at uh, people that take drugs to experience hallucinations like uh, psychedelics, uh, those hallucinations are more often visual. So there's some sort of different pathway involved uh, neurologically in the hallucinations that are induced by, uh, by those drugs um, than in um, psychotic disorders. So when people are, are, are hearing things, typically they're interpreting them as hearing uh, voices, some voice that's not their own coming from the outside uh, their mind, right? Because everybody has that inner voice, the inner monologue, where you're, if you're thinking about something, you can hear yourself talking to yourself, right? But for um, in psychosis, you don't experience it as yourself. You experience it as other. Uh, and it can be uh, noises or sounds, but typically um, whatever it is, it's interpreted as um language. So one interesting finding has been uh, when you have people that are experiencing auditory hallucinations, what's going on in their brain? So uh, and there's two areas of the brain we're really interested in, uh, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Uh, so uh, Broca's area is involved in speech production. So when you're talking, that's the area that's, that's lighting up. Uh, Wernicke's area is whenever um, somebody's talking to you and you're processing language or processing speech. So for a long time, the assumption would be, oh, well, it's going to be uh, Wernicke's area that's lighting up when people are having these auditory hallucinations because they're, they're hearing things. And if they're processing things, uh, it's, oh, some weird thing is being processed. Uh, there's some glitch in the system where they're, uh, that area, the area of the brain is lighting up when it shouldn't. Well, there's not really somebody talking, but they're experiencing as if somebody was. But that's not what we found. Um, more so, there's been activity in Broca's area, which seems to suggest that um, possibly auditory hallucinations are um, people talking to themselves, right? Because whenever you have your inner monologue, if you're thinking to yourself, I really ought to go to the grocery store and get some, uh, get some more fruit and vegetables to eat healthier, that would be good. Broca's area is lighting up in your brain when you're talking to yourself like that and kind of you know, non-psychotic thinking. So that's also happening when they're having these hallucinations. We'll suggest that maybe it's just that inner monologue, but for some reason, the glitch is that it's not recognized as being part of the self. There's been some dissociation there um, of that inner monologue and identity. Um, one thing to keep in mind, uh, the auditory is the most common form of hallucinations in schizophrenia, but if you see it portrayed in movies, uh, it's almost always portrayed as uh, visual hallucinations, right? Which, why? Well, it's much easier to show a visual hallucination than an auditory one, right? And that's just um, and one more example of how the media can uh, misrepresent mental disorders. And in particular, schizophrenia, there's a long history of misrepresentation of the disorder of, of psychotic disorders in, in the media. Uh, particularly in terms of uh, portrayals of dangerousness, like individual schizophrenia, disproportionately portrayed as violent, as murderers, 
and they may be slightly more likely to engage in violent acts than uh, people without uh, schizophrenia, but it's not not a lot, and they're way less likely to be violent than somebody that uh, meets criteria for a substance abuse disorder. Um, so they're they're not um, disproportionately dangerous as as much as they're portrayed in the media. Uh, delusions. So these are uh, kind of erroneous beliefs, uh, and they're strongly held. They're strongly held beliefs that are wrong, that are based on either uh, misrepresentations or misinterpretations of reality. So you think something's true, uh, and it's not. And usually there's something in the environment that you're seeing, hearing, um, observing in some way that's misrepresented, right? So... Um, if uh, somebody hears, you know, crickets outside and the crickets are chirping and they think, oh, those crickets, I think that's that's Morse code and it's a message to me from the government or from God or whatever. OK, that's a delusion, right? Because there is this actual thing in the environment that exists and you're hearing it, but you're misinterpreting it. And then you have this strong, strongly held belief about it. Are you sure it's, they're talking to you? Imagine me crickets. No, it's definitely they're talking to me. Whereas... If somebody's having that experience and you're in the room too and you don't hear any crickets at all okay well now that's a hallucination right because they're experiencing something they're perceiving without sensation so they can kind of look similar uh, in some ways um, now to classify something as evolution it, it's a little tricky because there's it's this kind of it's not black and white it's definitely gray and there's a threshold somewhere in terms of a strongly held belief how strongly held is it so if you're talking to somebody who's for example a flat earther you know they, I think the earth may be flat I think you know the government may be lying to us uh, and if you push people on it really really have you, have you been on a plane well you know I don't maybe it's a possibility if, if they can if they back off and maybe it's possible I think it's I think it, this could be I think we could all this conspiracy theory whatever could be true okay then it's not a delusion because it's not held with delusional intensity whereas if they yes absolutely this is uh and despite evidence to the contrary so they go up in a plane and they see the curvature of the earth uh, and they say nope that this is uh you've got the this window on the plane is a tv screen and you're you've uh have this computer simulation to make it look round, but it's really not okay yeah now that's a delusion so the types of delusions uh, can be a variety of different types. Some of the ones that are recognized in the DSM in, include uh, grandiose delusions, delusions of grandiosity, right, where you think you are um, have special powers or super smart, super strong, or that you're uh, some famous person, uh, you know, Jesus, Napoleon, uh, Gandhi, whatever. Um, they can be uh, persecutory, which often goes in line with some of that uh, paranoia that we see uh, sometimes with schizophrenia and schizophrenic spectrum disorders that people are uh, out to get you. Um, and again, uh, this has to be a misinterpretation of reality. So, you know, you see somebody, you know, walking by you in the mall and they reach up and scratch their ear and you go, oh my God, yeah, they're, they're checking their, uh, their earpiece. That's the CIA. They're all, they've got me surrounded. So they're not seeing things that aren't there. They're just misinterpreting things that are there. And again, for a persecutory delusion, in terms of uh, mapped onto this paranoid ideation that uh, um, people are out to get you. Uh, referential delusions, which kind of go back to what we talked about before um, about uh, magical thinking, ideas of reference, that again, uh, things are happening because of you or about you. Um, somatic delusions. Um, and this is usually about a misperception of the body, uh, thinking that uh, your uh, your organs have been taken uh, out of your body and replaced by other ones. Uh, your hand is not your own; that you know it's a Luke Skywalker uh, robotic hand, but they've made it so lifelike nobody can tell that it's a real hand and not a, a robot hand. Um, nihilistic delusions. Uh, this is about uh, kind of impending doom, end of the world that uh, you've got some sort of special knowledge that um, it's all going to end soon. Uh, and then erotomanic uh, delusions, the, this belief that someone is uh, in love with you. And often the erot erotomanic delusions, the someone that's in love with you is typically some sort of high status or celebrity person, some unattainable person. You know, they're, they're totally in love with me. Um, uh, and again, held with delusional intensity and persists despite evidence to the contrary. Uh, and another way you can kind of classify delusions is if they're bizarre or non-bizarre. 
And again, this gets a little um, squishy, right? So what's bizarre? Depends somewhat on your culture, right? Um, so the, like the one about organ replacement, that's typically thought to be a bizarre delusion. Now, depending on what circles you're running, if you think, you know, um, I think someone um, stole my kidneys, that may not be bizarre if you're running with uh, a certain, um, certain group of people that uh, may be victimized or engage in those activities where they do um, uh, organ harvesting uh, of individuals. Um, things that are typically not bizarre, uh, those ones of persecution, like, oh, the, the, the police are following me, um, these people are out to get me, someone's trying to poison me. Um, so things that are m more or less plausible tend to be considered non-bizarre, and things that are, well, that, there's no way that could happen, generally deemed, deemed as um, bizarre. Interestingly, the experience of hallucinations and delusions, um, the, the characteristics of those, of those symptoms often fit the, the context, the cultural, uh, educational, occupational context of a person's life, right? You're not going to have somebody who grows up uh, a Buddhist who then has a um, grandiose delusion that they're Jesus Christ, right? No, they're, they're going to um, have a different, their delusion or be reflective of their cultural context, right? Somebody who's um, been exposed to a lot of uh, religious material, more likely to have uh, some uh, religious religious themes to their delusions, maybe even hallucinations. Uh, and sometimes um, it even kind of makes sense, right? Where somebody has this kind of grandiose delusion, and you say, oh, well, this is somebody who most of their life has um, been uh, pushed down, put down, made to feel less than, well, it makes sense somewhat that there may be this reaction to see yourself as more than now in this kind of delusional uh, way. Um, okay, the, the negative symptoms. So the positive symptoms are, uh, you know, distortions of things that are already there. The negative symptoms are where you have this lack, this dearth, this uh, loss or deficit in normal functionings. So positive, there's stuff there, and now you have more negative stuff that's typically there was not there, it's less. Includes things like uh, affective flattening, uh, which is a lack of emotional expression. Um, so uh, when, when speaking, um, you know, you ch change your intonation to convey if you're really excited or really kind of sad, and that they don't have that a lack of intonation of speech, uh, which is called a uh, prosody. Uh, lack of use of nonverbals, uh, hand and face movement, so just very kind of um, monotone, robotic, expression um, when speaking. Uh, evolution, sorry, evolution, uh, which is a, a motivational deficit, you know, apathy. Uh, they may just sit in place uh, for hours at a time. And this is where just, no, it's not just, a, yeah, I don't want to do it. I can't muster the will to do the thing that I even maybe want to do, right? There's something uh, across the room that I want that's desirable, that has reward value for me but I can't make myself get up and go over there and get it. And that is uh, a symptom of uh, schizophrenic spectrum disorders. And these two, affective flattening and, and evolution, are probably the two uh, most common negative symptoms. Other symptoms that, that may be involved include alogia, which is a, a poverty of speech. Uh, so um, usually speaking in um, very short sentences, from, um, single word sentences, not saying much. Um, anhedonia, so the, the apparent lack of experience of, of pleasure. Um, so things that uh, should be enjoyable, not really able to enjoy it, just kind of, uh, it's something we see, uh, we talked before about in a major depressive episode, can, can be part of that as well. Just the, the energy, the life is sucked out of someone. Um, not surprisingly, it's more related to that. A sociality, so a lack of interest in uh, social interactions. So being kind of uh, withdrawn and not interested in being around people. Some of that, uh, like we talked before with um, schizoid personality disorder. So kind of the schizoid personality disorder, 
is overlaps a lot with the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. And then third, we have the, the probably the least understood group of symptoms, which are the disorganized symptoms, where you have just erratic and odd behaviors. Typically group it into two groups. One, uh, disorganized uh, thinking, which we can't see your thinking. So again, it's observed as disorganized speech. Uh, can manifest in a variety of ways, including uh, derailment or loose association, um, where the derailment obviously getting off track, and, and then uh, that loose association where they're saying, you know, um, I was going to go to the grocery store, store and get a, a tomato, you know, and the sauce of um, the, the sauce of salsa, uh, salsa dancing, going to Lombada, dirty dancing in Havana. Um, Nicki Minaj, or you can kind of you can sort of maybe see the thread that's going through, but it's a very loose uh, um, connection between ideas. And again, um, for those people that again you won't you aren't going to have this and poverty of speech. This is those that don't have poverty of speech, uh, at least at, at one point in time, and they uh, sometimes can uh, pick up steam. They start talking, and it maybe starts somewhat. Um, understandable or you can follow and then they start going faster and looser and then um, really getting to where you don't not sure what's going on also uh, tangentiality so tangential speech going from one topic uh, to the next without any kind of clear association uh, and then uh, rarely when you have really kind of uh, more profound psychosis it may get the point of word salad where there's just words being strung together that don't go together don't don't belong uh, in any kind of syntactical organization so in addition to disorganized thinking and speech the other kind of category is the grossly disorganized um, or abnormal motor behavior and this can uh, manifest in a couple ways one being what used to be referred to as uh, hebephrenia so silly and immature emotionality so kind of uh, giggling uh, um, Again, kind of seeming immature, childlike, you know, for an, uh, an adult. And then catatonia, which is a decreased reactivity to the environment, can manifest in a variety of ways. Uh, one being uh, negativism, right, which is where you have a, a resistance to instructions, where you tell somebody, hey, come here, and they, they don't come here, put that down, and they don't put it down. Overlaps a bit. Hopefully you, you recognize with uh, evolution, but it seems to be a motor behavior too, where they just can't seem to do what they're told, which uh, unfortunately puts them at risk um, if they interact with um, law enforcement and they are armed or uh, seem to be armed. And you know, when you're told to do something by uh, an officer, you should comply. But part of the problem for some people with schizophrenia is they can't because of the experience of, of negativism. They have a really hard time complying with uh, instructions which again is probably connected to that uh, evolution uh, apathy uh, symptom. Uh, catalepsy, uh, where you have uh, um, an, uh, kind of almost like a dystonia, um, where you can have uh, rigid movements, um, where you, uh, they you know, don't move, you can have waxy flexibility, where you can uh, position people into uh, bizarre postures and they'll, they'll hold them. Um, mutism, where they won't talk at all. Stupor, where they're just not moving at all. Uh, so a lot of withdrawal. And then oddly, kind of the opposite, catatonic excitement, where you have the psychomotor agitation, where you have kind of uh, some meaningless movements. Uh, you can also have stereotype movements, where they do something over and over again. When that happens, it's often uh, with uh, uh, grimacing or uh, grunting. Uh, you know, not, uh, not full vocalizations, but partial vocalizations. Uh, and then also kind of rarely uh, echolalia and echopraxia, uh, echolalia where uh, they'll repeat or parrot what somebody else says to them, uh, at least part of it, you know, if, um, so how are you doing today, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, just repeat that one piece over and over again, echopraxia, same thing, but with uh, motor movements. So uh, echoing or copying someone else's motor movements in a kind of stereotypic uh, fashion. Um, so, you know, catatonia uh, occurs with, uh, or can occur with schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. It can also occur with um, major depressive disorder, 
it can be a feature of that. Um, and it can also occur with some neurodevelopmental disorders, which we'll talk about later. Okay, so the DSM criteria for schizophrenia. So two or more of the following for a significant portion of time during a one-month period. Uh, and at least one of uh, the things with an asterisk, asterisk is present. So uh, delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech. So you have to have at least one of those, and you could have just you could have two of those: delusions and hallucinations. That's enough. Delusions, disorganized speech. That's enough. Hallucinations, disorganized speech. That's enough. Or you could have one of those three, and then also uh, the grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, or negative symptoms right, during this uh, one month period. So this uh, um, episode, this period of, uh, of having these symptoms, uh, is associ associated with a significant decline in level of functioning in a major area uh, of living. And this is to distinguish from people that have uh, you know, severe cognitive impairments, um, mental retardation, that may not be able to do some things and show some kind of disorganized speech and maybe some what looks like negative symptoms. But if they've kind of always been that way and it's been this slow... Uh, chronic thing that's always been there because it's a related to a, a developmental delay. Well, it's not that. This is where there's some sort of uh, pre-morbid before something happened, things were okay and you were uh, functioning well in terms of taking care of yourself, uh, working, having relationships, but then there's this onset of this thing and there's this huge decline in at least uh, one area, uh, a major area of living. And then meet full criteria for schizophrenia. You have to have continuous signs of disturbance for uh, at least six months. So you don't have to have the, you know, you have to have two symptoms for at least a month. There's this period of a month of kind of the psychotic episode. Kind of like we think about um, a, a mood episode, a major depressive episode, a, a manic episode, a hypomanic episode. There's a time limit where you have to have, okay, all these symptoms during this time. And then outside of that time frame, you still have some residual symptoms. Same thing with schizophrenia. You have to have some residual symptoms uh, for, for six months. And it can be uh, just negative symptoms or it can be, um, you know, attenuated or lessened delusions, uh, lessened hallucinations. Um, and then obviously, you know, it's not caused by um, some other uh, condition um, or, you know, drugs. The other schizophrenia spectrum disorders, uh, one we've already talked about, schizotypal personality disorder, thought to be part of that spectrum, right? We have that odd eccentric uh, behavior, some magical thinking. Uh, delusional disorder, so this is where you have, uh, obviously, delusions, so some delusional thinking, but it's not schizophrenia. You don't meet full criteria for uh, schizophrenia, which typically means you don't also have hallucinations or, you know, the grossly disorganized um, behavior or catatonia. You can have hallucinations. If you do, for it to be delusional disorder and not schizophrenia, the hallucinations must not be prominent and they must be consistent with the delusions. So again, if you think, um, you know, the government's uh, spying on you and then um, you think you hear something in the walls, oh yeah, they're setting up more, more microphones in the walls and nobody else hears that, okay, well that's consistent with your delusion. It's not a major part of it. You're not, not seeing... See, seeing people come in the room or talking to you, it's more of just kind of noises that you think you hear, okay, then it's probably delusional disorder. Um, and the functioning of individuals in delusional disorder is typically less impaired than for schizophrenia. It's kind of, a, a, if we're looking at the spectrum, there's schizotypal is down on one end, schizophrenia is on the other end, delusional somewhere in between, uh, not as much impairment. Uh, people can, uh, depending on their environment, their occupational social status, they might get by and be okay in life uh, with their delusions if they've built some coping mechanisms around it. Um, for the most part, some individuals that uh, are diagnosed with delusional disorder do go on to develop schizophrenia, right? So they eventually have more prominent hallucinations or um, disorganized uh, behavior. And then at that point, the diagnosis changes. Schizoaffective disorder. So this is where you have a mood episode concurrent with meeting criterion A of schizophrenia. Criterion A being that, you know, hallucinations, delusions, disorganized behavior, negative symptoms, um, all that stuff. <clears throat> so, meaning full criteria for a mood episode, and that can be uh, major depressive, manic, hypomanic, uh, well, sorry, major depressive and manic. If, you, if you're having psychotic symptoms, it, it, 
by definition, no longer is hypomanic, jumps to, to manic. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But so it can be depression, can be mania. Um, seems to be a little more likely uh, with with mania, having the, the kind of co-occurring things. But again, you could have a mood disorder with psychotic features, where you've got uh, during a mood episode you've got these um, hallucinations or delusions, right? And if so, it's just major depressive disorder with psychotic features, bipolar one with psychotic features. For it to be schizoaffective, you've got to have that, which is this concurrent thing, mood and psychosis stuff going on. But you also, for it to be schizoaffective, you also have to have um, some positive symptoms of schizophrenia, hallucinations, or delusions, for uh, at least two weeks in the absence of a mood episode or prominent mood symptoms. Right? So this is where you really are having kind of both things happening, where you have the psychosis with mood, and then also even when you come out of that mood episode, you either come down from mania, come up from the depression, but there's still some hallucinations and delusions there. Okay, that seems to be something different, and that is this thing we talk about being excuse me, schizoaffective disorder, which is really this combination of a psychotic disorder and a mood disorder being mushed together. Um, okay, and then the other uh, two spectrum disorders are really um, versions of, seemingly versions of schizophrenia where the, it's schizophrenia, but you didn't have symptoms for long enough. So brief psychotic disorder, where you have one or more of the symptoms in criterion A for schizophrenia. So you have delusions, um, maybe, but uh, no hallucinations. Or hallucinations, but no delusions. Or you can have more, but you have at least one of those kind of criterion A schizophrenia symptoms. And it lasts for at least a day, but no longer than a month. So it's brief. And it, again, typically is a couple of days when, when this happens. Uh, and then to meet criteria, there also has to be a full return to pre-morbid functioning. So there's this period of time where you're having these psychotic symptoms, hallucinating, having delusions, maybe even having some uh, catatonia. But then when it's over, it's over, and you go back to the way you were. And that's it. It doesn't come back. Really fascinating that this can happen. And typically when it happens, uh, it's in times of... Um, heightened stress. It seems to be a, a kind of a stress reaction. You've heard, heard that term cloakal breakdown, right? Uh, a mental collapse. And for some people that may look like a brief psychotic disorder where you know, life is really hard and it's stressful and they're not sleeping. And then and they're not sleeping may be a big part of it. For a brief time, they are psychotic. But then they recover and then they don't have those psychotic symptoms uh, ever again. Um, one thing that kind of symptoms can help you figure out, well, is this, is this a brief psychotic uh, uh, disorder or is this just schizophrenia and we're going to see these symptoms come back? One kind of clue is when it happens, right? For uh, schizophrenia, that first psychotic episode is typically uh, in your 20s, mid to early 20s. For uh, brief psychotic disorder, it's got a later onset. The average onset is in your mid 30s, right? So somebody that is a little older and has kind of emerging psychotic symptoms for the first time, we think, okay, this is a brief psychotic disorder, or they're on drugs, or they've got a brain tumor, right? We're less likely to suspect schizophrenia, although it can happen, but less likely. Um, so at least a day, no more than a month. So what if you go a month, but not all the way to the six month for schizophrenia? Well, then it's schizophreniform disorder, right? So criterion A for at least a month, but less than six months. So frequently, this uh, uh, diagnosis is one that is given uh, with a, uh, the added little proviso of provisional, right? So somebody has uh, met criteria A for a month of schizophrenia, so we know it's no longer brief psychotic disorder, but uh, they're in the hospital now, and it's only been a month or two months since they first had symptoms. Well, they don't meet criteria for schizophrenia yet, so it's schizophrenia schizophreniform disorder provisional and about a third of individuals who are diagnosed with schizophreniform recover kind of like the brief psychotic and are okay they return to pre-morbid functioning and don't have a return of psychotic symptoms the rest the other two thirds do go on to develop um, schizophrenia so again for some people this is kind of like a, a longer version of brief psychotic disorder but for others well it's just schizophrenia we just don't know it yet because there hasn't been time enough um, to, to be sure because for schizophrenia you can you, you have to have six months of um, continuous disturbance 
Okay, thinking about the, the causes, the etiology, looking at biological factors. Obviously, genetics are going to play a role. Schizophrenia, probably, uh, no, probably about it. One of the mental, mental disorders, one of the things in the DSM, that there's the most evidence of a genetic um, contribution. All right, so if we look at um, risk factors, so if someone uh, you know has schizophrenia, what's the odds, what's the percentage that you'll have schizophrenia? So general population, again, it's about a 1% odds. You know, if you know somebody in, in the world, they're not related to you at all genetically, well, you've got a 1% chance uh, of having schizophrenia as well because everybody has that chance. Now, if uh, your first cousin has schizophrenia, your odds of having schizophrenia uh, have increased by 100%. Oh my God, 100%? Yeah, they went from 1% to 2%. But that's an increase of 100%. So again, be careful when people talk about stats that way. Uh, but if you look, you go from first cousins to uncles and aunts, nephews and nieces, grandchildren, half-siblings. As we go down that, that y-axis, what we're looking at primarily is uh, an increase in genetic relatedness, right? You share more genes with um, your grandchildren than you do with a first cousin. Uh, you share more genes um, with your children than you do with half-siblings. And the one that's probably most striking is when we go get down to... Um, twins right fraternal twins identical twins so if your fraternal twin has schizophrenia 70 percent chance that you have schizophrenia if your identical twin has it 48 percent a big jump right when we go from uh, sharing about half of your dna to sharing you know 99.9 percent .9 of your dna with this other person so it's like wow that's really big evidence that genetics play a role but it's also evidence that genetics don't tell the whole story, right? If genetics told the whole story, if it were entirely genetically determined, what would the concordance rate be for identical twins? If your twin has it, what are the odds you're going to have it? Well, much closer to 100%, twice as much as what they are. It's only, it's only 48, you know, 50%. So genetics are important, but they're not everything. Also look at um, siblings versus fraternal twins, right? Siblings are no more genetically, are no less genetically related than our fraternal twins, right? It's just fraternal twins shared the same or more similar intrauterine environment are born at the same time, probably have more similar environments, right? Because they have the same birthday than do non-twin siblings. But the odds, again, double. They go from 9% to 17% when you go from a sibling to a fraternal twin. So genetics are important, but there's some, something else going on uh, as well. And when we look at the genetic risk, it really seems to be nonspecific. It seems to be more for a schizophrenic spectrum. Right, so if you have a, a, a twin who is a delusional disorder, okay, you're at increased risk for also having some other schizophrenic spectrum disorder. Maybe not that same one. Maybe not delusional disorder. Maybe schizophrenia. Maybe schizophreniform. Uh, maybe schizotypal. So that the genetic risk seems to be nonspecific. There's something going on that has to do with this combination of behaviors um, that has a genetic influence, but it's not for a particular disorder. Has it's, The risk is more for... The, the spectrum and as I already said um, there's something going on in terms of environmental factors kind of non unshared environments where these two people are experiencing the world differently and their different experiences are leading to either increasing or decreasing the likelihood of uh, developing the symptoms of uh, a schizophrenic spectrum disorder um, what else um, there's some evidence that uh, you know, pregnancy and birth complications may may play a role. Um, people with schizophrenia, diagnosed with schizophrenia, have a, a, a greater history uh, that more common to have in their history uh, birth complications, uh, breech birth, extended labor, uh, loss of oxygen uh, during birth, or they get a little hypoxic. Um, but if you look at the reverse, if you look at the people who had birth complications, well, most people with birth complications don't develop schizophrenia. So it's not, oh, that's what it is, because it doesn't always. But for some people, maybe it's playing a role. Um, so you can't really uh, conclude causation because you can't assign people to have complications or not. And there may be kind of a third variable going on, right? Maybe 
maybe some groups of people are more likely to experience uh, birth complications, right? If you have um, less maternal nutrition, um, uh, greater uh, stress, maybe those things are going to um, be associated with the um, birth complications and also associated with schizophrenia for other reasons. Again, maybe it's a genetic thing where you have this kind of downward drift hypothesis where uh, over time, families, bloodlines that carry a uh, risk for schizophrenia um, are going to uh, drift downward in a societal hierarchy, right? Because it's hard to hold a job down and be successful with uh, kind of these chronic psychotic uh, conditions. Uh, and if, um, you know, grandparent, great-grandparent had schizophrenia and had a hard time being successful, once it's hard for them to be successful, the next generation has a hard time being successful. Even if they don't have schizophrenia themselves, they're starting from a step back, right? And as that occurs more frequently along that family line, each time somebody who develops the disorder taking a step back, it can lead to uh, driving down people downward in a kind of societal economic hierarchy, this downward drift, which is why sometimes you see this association between poverty and schizophrenia, seemingly, well, it could be because this has happened uh, over time. Another thing related to kind of uh, birth and, and pregnancy is viral infections, particularly the uh, influenza. Um, individuals with schizophrenia are more likely to have been born in winter months than other folks. Um, and uh, based on kind of chart review, seem to be more likely to have uh, been exposed to the, the flu, that the moms were exposed to the flu while pregnant. So there, for some people, it's like, okay, could the flu virus have caused some change uh, in utero or soon after birth that um, contributed to the development of schizophrenia? Maybe. But again, th third variable problem, you know, well, who's more likely to get exposed to the flu? Well, people that um, don't have reliable housing situations, that are out in the cold, uh, that don't have, um, you know, a healthy diet to promote uh, good immune functioning, all those things. Um, so it's tricky. In terms of uh, differences in the brain, neuropathology, uh, you know, there's studies showing decreased brain tissue and enlarged ventricles, which are spaces in the brain. Uh, some of those studies are um, of individuals before treatment. A lot of the early studies are people that, uh, after they'd been on, you know, neuroleptics and these drugs for a long time, which the drugs themselves caused brain pathology, uh, cell death. And so it was kind of hard to tell, well, are these structural differences because of the treatment or because of the disorder? And now it seems like, you know, there certainly seem to be sometimes uh, because of the disorder. Because some people that haven't been treated show these differences um, in terms of ventricle size, uh, smaller structures in the limbic area, the temporal lobe. Um, but it's not consistent, right? In all the studies that have been done, never do all the people with some neurological difference have schizophrenia, right? So some people that have an enlarged ventricle, have this enlarged space, don't have schizophrenia. Some do. Uh, and not everybody who has schizophrenia shows that difference. So there's some patterns. Well, okay, well, this difference is more common in people with schizophrenia than people without, but it's not not an always sort of thing. So uh, in terms of psychosocial factors, so basically it seems like uh, schizophrenia largely biological. Well, what about the other part? Well, we don't really know. But there's uh, probably something going on in terms of uh, social class, right? And this is what goes back to what I was talking before about that downward, uh, downward drift. Um, that uh, being of a lower social class doesn't necessarily cause schizophrenia. Now, to some degree, it may exacerbate a, uh, a vulnerability, right? Because if uh, with the lower SES often comes uh, greater stress, right? Less access to uh, health care to uh, healthy nutrition, put you at risk for a variety of things. Um, but then the um, the other thing being that maybe it's, it's that downward drift that over time in families that have uh, experience with psychosis, it's harder and harder to be successful economically and socially. And that's why you see these kind of um, aggregation of psychotic disorders uh, associated with uh, uh, lower SES. Um, so one finding kind of related to this is that um, 
Male schizophrenic uh, patients are typically um, less successful um, than their fathers, which traditionally hasn't been true for um, people without schizophrenia. Um, but even with that, fathers of people with schizophrenia are disproportionately from uh, lower SES than fathers of people without schizophrenia. So uh, probably a bit of both, right? Where uh, you have a downward drift and also that uh, social causation with the stress. Um, we try to reassure people that it's not bad parenting, mostly. In terms of it's not what we thought before with things like the schizophrenic mother, where, you know, it's all the, well, if they think it's schizophrenia, it's the mom's fault. She wasn't loving enough. She was cold and distant, and she made this happen. Well, not typically, right? And part of what probably happened uh, with the, the development of that hypothesis, you had these kind of odd, atypical kids that weren't comfortable being close to someone. And so, you know, mothers who initially tried to be close are rebuffed and consciously, unconsciously begin to pull back. So then when they present to the clinic, you see this mother being sent off. And she's like, oh, what a horrible person. But no, she's just reacting to and adapting to that child. So it doesn't seem to be that um, being a cold and distant mother causes schizophrenia. And it doesn't seem to be that there's this, this uh, we should think of this uh, uh, double bind phenomenon, uh, which again, blaming the mother. Thanks, Freud. Where they're telling the kid, uh, come here, come here, honey, I love you. But as the kid approaches, making a face and grimacing, which is kind of giving the come here, go away, mixed messages. And that the idea being that, oh, these mixed messages are so confusing to kid, kids, that causes the dissociation of the mind and causes schizophrenia. Uh, no, there's not really any support for that. So not the parents' fault in terms of uh, those things traditionally, you know, especially blaming the mom. But, but disruptive family relations in childhood are um, somewhat predictive of schizophrenia. And again, not everybody who has a rough childhood who has uh, disruptive relationships develops schizophrenia. But if you look at people who have a risk factor, right, so they have some sort of identified genetic vulnerability because of a family member, some people go on to develop schizophrenia, some don't. And we're trying to figure out, well, what's the difference? One difference that uh, they've identified in the research is, oh, the ones that go on had kind of these problematic family relationships in, in childhood. Which again, directionally, is that because, so did the those relational experiences cause stress, which exacerbated the problem, or were the kids who had more things going on in their minds and their brains did that cause greater disruption in family relationships? Hard to know. Hard to know. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, stress doesn't cause schizophrenia. For those people who have schizophrenia, uh, there is a relationship, relationship between stress and uh, exacerbation of positive symptoms. So, you know, people can recover from psychotic episodes and they, um, they still have residual symptoms, right? Where they still have some negative uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, attenuated uh, positive symptoms, kind of minor delusions. Okay, looking at uh, treatment, some of the, the older things that were tried, uh, insulin shock therapy, where you know you're um, giving them high doses of insulin to cause uh, uh, seizures, uh, electroconvulsive therapy, seemed to be more used for punishment than anything, uh, and then lobotomy, you know, destroying brain tissue. Um, all things that at one point in time said, hey, this is going to be the greatest thing ever, Look, it's working so wonderfully, and then we go, oh, wow, really bad side effects, and you're just causing brain damage and hurting people. There's these horrible side effects. Probably stop doing that. Uh, and for the most part, they have. For the most part. Um, primary medical intervention is medication. So you've got your traditional antipsychotics, first-generation antipsychotics, which are um, dopamine antagonists, as kind of referred to before. So they'll... Um, block dopamine functioning at particular receptor sites, so they won't won't block dopamine everywhere, right? They're usually designed to target different receptor sites. Some, most of them, more D2 receptors, some D4, um, and they can fairly quickly reduce the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Uh, much less effective at having any kind of impact on negative symptoms. Uh, unfortunately. Um, they can have these uh, extrapyramidal side effects, right? Extrapyramidal being there are uh, neurons in your brain that are pyramidal neurons, triangle shaped, hence the name pyramidal, um, involved in uh, motor functioning. And motor functioning, moving your arms about and your legs, uh, all those things, dopamine plays a big role. 
And if we're blocking dopamine receptors, uh, unfortunately, we can cause uh, down regulation of dopaminergic activity. So getting receptors to turn off, um, to stop working, uh, if we, you know, we're doing this over time. And that can have these uh, side effects, these motor side effects, where you have uh, you know, akathisia, where you have this restlessness, uh, dystonia, where you've got um, um, uh, this motor dysfunction, um, not, able to, not able to control your, your, your body, uh, tardive dyskinesia, being one of the ones that's talked about a lot, where you get the uh, kind of a shuffling movement and the uh, abnormal mouth movements with the tongue rolling around in the mouth, puffing the cheeks, um, some of which, some of these symptoms... Uh, are temporary and can be uh, relieved some medications looking at trying to fix some of the stuff but sometimes for some people things like tardive dyskinesia are permanent where you know you've given these people these drugs to deal with these symptoms but then you ultimately cause this uh, other uh, permanent brain damage so uh, you know, problematic uh, and then beyond that other side effects include uh, prominent ones uh, sedation and anticholinergic side effects uh, the anticholinergic ones because it tar it's um, blocking the uh, cholinergic system um, that's things like uh, dry mouth uh, blurred vision constipation so you can't drying up in your body um, which are things that uh, aren't pleasant obviously so after that you know in the 50s you have these traditional antipsychotics they're gonna be great uh, oh side effects stop using them and we come back with oh but look we've got these second generation antipsychotics they're gonna fix everything uh, and so they had uh, less affinity for the D2 receptor sites, so they worked slightly different. Still targeting dopamine uh, uh, and targeting D2 a bit, but not as much. So you're going to get, uh, you know, hopefully less extrapyramidal side effects. And then they have a higher affinity for 5-HT or serotonin receptors. So again, involving now some other neurotransmitters, maybe that's going to uh, do the trick. And so uh, there's initial an initial 10 years of excitement that. Um, now we've, we've cracked the code, this is going to be it, uh, and, th and they're also going to uh, effectively treat negative symptoms. They're going to be so much better, uh, but ultimately disappointment. And not disappointment in terms of they don't work at all. They just don't work that much better than traditional, and uh, they're not that much safer. They have some other side effects. So you may be less likely to have the extrapyramidal effects, but then you have risks of uh, you know, a granulocytosis and other kind of blood diseases uh, that will uh, kill you. So ultimately what it comes down to for the medications is they, they can work in terms of reducing positive symptoms fairly well. But not everyone works for everybody. You know, it's about a 50% success rate. Success being, oh, it reduces symptoms. Not success, you're cured. As long as you're taking it, you'll, be, oh, you'll have less hallucinations and delusions. The problem is people don't want to take it, right? Because they have a hard time tolerating the side effects. So the trick for uh, psychiatrists is to find out, okay, uh, which drug or combination of drugs will work the best for you and that you'll be willing to keep on taking because you're going to have some side effects. Which ones bother you the most? Which ones bother you the least? Okay, in terms of uh, psychosocial treatments, it's largely uh, adjunctive treatment. So it's not going to be your um, primary treatment. You're not going to, somebody has schizophrenia, they're unlikely to come to a, a therapist, a counselor's office to do talk therapy and not be on some sort of medication. So typically medication is frontline and then we're also going to do this adjunctive um, therapy uh, as well. Things that seem to help uh, family oriented aftercare. So this is kind of going back to what I talked about before about educating families about schizophrenia and also providing them with uh, coping skills, uh, addressing uh, that uh, emotional expression, uh, uh, Piece, so they learn how to express themselves in a way that uh, is more easily tolerated by the person with schizophrenia, less likely to cause upset and relapse. Um, so uh, these types of programs can uh, help people maintain longer periods between psychotic episodes. So they don't typically stop them, but you can have longer periods of uh, sanity. Um, but they tend to be uh, fairly expensive and for them to work the professionals have to stay involved over time right so if you do this intense intervention things get better and they're good for about a year uh, okay and we stopped intervening but we taught you a thing you can do it now well about a, another year after that 
and we start seeing some decrements in the effects and the longer we go away from the intervention the less it goes because people go back to their previous patterns of um, behavior social skills training so um, even whenever these uh, uh, medications are helping with positive symptoms they don't help as much with the negative symptoms and a lot of times those negative symptoms uh, are associated with um, decrements in the um, social interaction which makes sense you know if you're hallucinating and having delusions and, and acting odd people aren't going to want to be around you and you're going to get isolated and then you're going to kind of not learn or know how to interact with people so one component of uh, psychosocial intervention is to teach people how to be around people, how to have the appropriate amount of eye contact, how to initiate conversations, how to share uh, some about yourself but not too much, um, all those things. Um, which again, this isn't necessarily going to keep you from having a, a relapse of a psychotic episode, but it can improve quality of life in between because we need people in our lives, right? So helping people uh, with the skills they need to, to do that uh, can be helpful. Uh, cognitive therapy uh, may have a role in terms of, uh, especially with uh, hallucinations and delusions, helping people learn to evaluate and, and, and kind of test, do reality testing, and uh, correct their distorted thinking. Um, because, you know, schizophrenia is largely a thought disorder, so helping people learn uh, tricks, patterns of uh, rational thought can help, again, uh, in those the, those periods between uh, psychotic episodes. Um, one of the things that's um, the most uh, effective, but um, not often used due to limited resources, is this idea of assertive, assertive community treatment and, and other similar ones. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary approach uh, that does you know therapy, education, education, medication, crisis intervention, um, and if you've got all these different uh, professionals involved and connected to a family and an individual, you can significantly reduce hospitalizations. Right? They can function and live in the community, and they won't be getting hospitalized for these psychotic episodes. It's great. It's expensive. You got to pay all those people to stay involved all the time. Um, so, you know, uh, in, the, in the lab, in the research field, yeah, it works. But who's going to now uh, pay for this thing that works because it's not cheap? Um, and then for your, your chronic um, patients who, you know, if they're starting to cycle through getting uh, repeatedly hospitalized, they may go in for longer inpatient stays in kind of institutional programs um, where you have these uh, carefully structured programs with token economies, uh, and they can result in some improvement. And again, this is typically the people that um, are having the most difficulties, the most chronic. So success from these settings, um, you know, isn't that isn't that bright and sunny? Where you know, a success story is, hey, after four years, we had 11% of people in the program uh, be able to exit the institution, and and that's that's a yay moment because the idea being that. We don't know that any of these people will, will be able to go and function independently outside of institutional setting. Uh, so kind of more severe uh, cases. Um, and keep in mind that historically there there was, there was a shift from uh, for institutionalization. Right? We talked at the beginning of the semester about the history of um, abnormal behavior in psychiatry where you had uh, people that were probably had uh, schizophrenia and other uh, mental disorders that were locked up in jails or poor houses uh, and then these asylums which were essentially poor houses that weren't getting treatment just being locked up and then you know you had uh, you know, Philippe Pinel uh, and um, um, I'm blanking on the American Benjamin uh, come in and start providing treatment right and things got better but then you had for a variety of reasons overcrowding and you have overcrowding, you have decline in treatment, and things got worse, and then you got really bad asylums, and the answer was, rather than putting more money into the asylums and giving them more resources, the answer was, well, let's shut them down and go into the community, and we'll have these community mental health centers. Idealistic 60s, uh, people will take care of uh, their loved ones uh, in their communities. 
fucking great idea, didn't work that great for a lot of people, right? So we have a, a large population of homeless individuals um, suffering from schizophrenic spectrum disorders uh, because we have the deinstitutionalization movement. Well, so these people have a hard time functioning independently, but there's nowhere for them to go. There's not institutions for them to go to. There's not very many, not very many beds. And then they have a hard time staying connected with these community mental health centers because typically it involves some social support system, some family, friends that's going to drive them there, take them there, make sure they're taking their meds, that sort of thing. And for a variety of reasons, we have a, a, some disintegration of family units uh, in, in society um, leading to uh, a real problem with um, homelessness for those people that um, might benefit from institutional programs, but we just don't have very many of them anymore. Okay, wrapping up, take home. Um, the schizophrenic spectrum disorders, psychotic disorders, are disruptive um, chronic disorders that make it difficult to fit in uh, in society, right? To meet kind of societal obligations for relationships and work, um, hard to do with psychotic disorder, right? These people often have, you know, odd, aberrant behavior that is off-putting to people, and they have a hard time being around others, which leads to this kind of um, isolation. Uh, and, it, and from a um, subjective point of view, it can be really scary, right? Having hallucinations and delusions, having the idea that the knowledge, this kind of meta-knowledge that I think I'm losing my mind, I think I'm losing contact with reality, because right? that's there at some point. And eventually they may get past to it, uh, past that reality testing to now, um, you know, they're full into their delusions and hallucinations. But before they get there, usually there is some realization that this is happening and it's incredibly uh, frightening uh, and upsetting. Again, we can reduce the positive symptoms with medications, but adherence is an issue because those medications have some problems, side effects that are uh, both inconvenient and in some cases um, lethal and damaging. So research you know, must continue to find um, something to help uh, and a question uh, I'll leave you with, um, don't have an answer for it, but just a question, what is the, the obligation, moral, ethical, of a society or a government to care for these individuals who have this uh, disorder with a strong biological component that significantly interferes with their ability to care for themselves? Do we, the collective we, have any obligation to these people or not? Or are they on their own? If we have an obligation, what is it and what should we do about it? Something to think about. Um, that's all for now. Take care.